Andy Haldane is truly one of my, thank you, one of my, the most brilliant and original minds in analyzing the complexity of today's finance and of the possible policies. But I didn't know that he was also brilliant at analyzing human beings. And I think he's given us a wonderful, a wonderful example of this other side of him. Well, it's an honor, but it's also a challenge to try to respond to that. But Mariana, the boss of this thing, very intelligently gave me a different task. You can't hear? Okay. What she said was, let's begin a conversation, let's begin a dialogue between finance, which is Andy's space, and technology, which is my space, and which is also Mariana's space, and which is what we're trying to do today, right? So the question would be, supposing we were to apply everything that Andy told us and everything that he was not able to tell us because we cut him off. Supposing we didn't cut him off? <laughs> anyway, supposing we did that and we changed the behavior of investors and they stopped being just short-termist and they started wanting to be long-termist. Do you think we would get a fantastically growing economy? Would they actually find those projects that are long-term and that are good and profitable and that can give us the jobs and give us? No, they wouldn't. And what I'm trying to talk about today is why they wouldn't and what we need to do in order to get such a contest a context going, setting it up, so that in fact those, even the short-term ones, but especially the long-term investors would find a dynamic economy full of innovation that can really bring what we want from investment. It is true if you don't invest, you don't get there, but it's also true that if there, if there isn't enough good things to invest in, you cannot get there either. So, one of the big problems is that today we're not investing, we're not only investing in short term, we're not only not investing in long term, but there's plenty of money that's not being invested in anything real at all, but it's just in casino finance. And all that money which is looking for profits, easy profits, because they can get them, because regulation allows it, because all sorts of things, could we actually get them going into the real economy? Well, the problem is that for investment to be attractive and profitable, it has to be part of a synergistic context. What does that mean? Well, we have seen it with information technology, we have seen that they themselves provide a context that is an enabler of profitable innovation today. But even using ICT, there need to be many projects with a similar technological bias in many different industries, because ICT can transform them all, but they need to create technology systems, just like you, Luciano was talking about sorry, Luciano, <laughs> not Italian, uh, was talking about the need to get many institutions and many things together to get the technology systems going. You need common services, specialized suppliers, skills, user habits that will create the necessary externalities, the synergies to attract further projects in the same direction, as well as complementary activities and business models because history shows us that it's very often those complementary activities that create the most jobs. The best jobs perhaps are in the high productivity things, but it's the big combinations of many, many industries, including little ones and simple ones that are interconnected that really create the jobs. So, 
while the industries of a, technology, of a technological revolution create their own synergies. I mean, you had microprocessors and then computers, and the more computers, the more microprocessors, and then internet, and the more internet, the more computers, the more computers, the more mobile phones, the more, you know, and it all goes. They're fine, they create markets for each other, they create suppliers for each other, but how about all the other industries that could do things, but don't have the same feedback connection? Well, Actually, the reason we, why we call them revolutions, we talk about the information revolution, is because it, they can change every other industry. But in order to get that, we need mission orientation. It can be putting a man on the moon, as narrow as that, or it can be the whole of suburbanization, the creating uh, the possibility of home ownership for everybody, including the workers, that imagine the markets for inventing machines to put in the home and the kitchen and the thing, television, the other refrigerated foods, plastics, everything you can throw out, windows, curtains, you know, the whole world. Everybody has a house and therefore everybody needs all sorts of things. Look at mass production, the previous revolution coming through. And before that, the age of steel uh, at the end of the 19th century and so on. What did we have then? we had government demand for infrastructure. It was cheap steel, and what you had was world <laughs> infrastructure. You had the transcontinental railways, the ports, the ships, the, the whole thing. And it was all done by government procurement. So that was another generator of synergies. Of course, around that there were millions of things. But the huge thing that was moving was very much led by government pro procurement. But of course, that means that having a common direction requires steering, however unpalatable that might be, might be for the pure market advocates. It requires not a level playing field. It requires a tilted playing field, strongly tilted playing field in a good direction, in a clear direction. So this also means that the market cannot be relied upon to do this. Because the market just takes advantage of what's there. It doesn't change what's there. The context is what, is what has to be changed so that they do take advantage. That's the whole idea. But you've got to make it so that they can get a, take advantage of something that's already well thought out and has to do with the power of the technologies that are available. Now, to understand why this is necessary, we need to understand technology and we need to learn from history. The situation we face today happens only once in a century, maybe twice. It's midway in the life of each technological revolution. So we are now in the equivalent of the 1930s, not the 1980s. That was the death of mass production and little information technology coming up and, you know, all this crazy matter. And this is very different. Today we have a huge potential. Information technology is fully installed. And who's taking uh, advantage of it? All those little kids doing apps. And of course, Google and Microsoft and all these guys. But how about the rest of the economy? How much is the rest of the economy really doing everything that could be done? Well, we need, we need to change the situation. Right now, an immense amount of things that are technologically feasible <coughs> are not market, they have high market risk, and they're not profitable. We have the example of solar power and, and wind power. It's taken all sorts of, you know, a lot of subsidizing and feed-in tariffs and this and that to get that going because the conditions are not there yet. So the projects that are being considered for investment today be they short or long term, are a fraction of what they could be. And because of the short termism of both the, the regular stock market and the venture capital, because of their short termism, and because it's so easy to be in the casino, in fact, in the end, it's a fraction of a fraction what really comes to the table for people to decide whether they want it short or long term. So how do we get out of the trap? Well, I already told you, by tilting the playing field. How was it done in the 30s and 40s? By a set of institutional and financial innovations 
steering innovation in two main directions, suburbanization and the Cold War. Those were the two huge forces that made mass production really spread. Cheap oil, the automobile, electricity, and the mass production revolution created conditions for building cheap houses on cheap land outside the cities where there was nothing because, you know, railways <laughs> didn't stop in the middle. People couldn't get there. Horses were too far. So by the time you get the automobile, you can fill those houses with innovative electrical appliances and plastics for all purposes. But for that, for widespread ownership, you needed several things. You needed government to build roads. Government give un gave unemployment insurance so that you could continue paying your, both your house and your things. Uh, it provided mortgage guarantees. It, uh, and the private sector developed various forms of consumer credit for housing, for cars, for appliances. The official labor unions, they were officialized. They could now keep salaries growing with productivity, even if companies didn't want to. That made sure that everybody had bigger markets. And the welfare state, of course, allowed with progressive taxes, you could maintain both the welfare state and military procurement and R&D. So then internationally, you had stability, trade, and investment enabled by IMF, the dollar, the, the GATT the World Bank, and so on. What was all that? It was a set of very bold and imaginative institutional innovations, most of them thanks to Keynes, that provided dynamic and solvent demand, guiding innovation, investment, and expansion. Could there be a direction ahead that could fulfill the role with the ICT revolution today? one that fulfills the aspirations of people, both in developed countries, even the ones that have slid down, come back up, and developing countries, and that is compatible with hard limits on global resources? Yes, yes, yes. That direction is green growth, accompanied by full global development. Green growth is about shifting production and consumption patterns completely towards intangible goods, materials and energy saving, multiplying the productivity of resources, and creating new markets, new models, rental rather than possession, all sorts of things. It actually implies a redefinition of the good life, of the aspirational life, copying what educated people are already doing, like has happened every time. Every technological revolution has changed lifestyles radically. Very importantly, Victorian living was different from the cosmopolitan Belle Epoque and the American way of life different from that. And what we could have ahead is the good green life. Healthy, exercise, wonderful, no obesity, no couch potatoes, a whole wonderful, different, and environmentally friendly life and full global development. Why? <laughs> because that's like the workers used to be in the previous one. You need enormous, and like for the, for the third surge with the infrastructure. In order for all those African, Latin American nations, all those countries, Middle East, etc., to grow, they will need infrastructure. They will need equipment. They will need engineering. They will need education. So guess where would be the markets for a lot of the high-tech things? There. So we now are talking, as Keynes did at the time, of a way of getting demand moving. And what I suggest is that we have to stop worrying about secular stagnation and create the conditions for the next golden age. A golden age that can do for the whole of the world population what the post-war boom did for the population of these advanced countries. So that's how we would like to initiate this dialogue between finance, which provides the money, and the technological direction with government being an active actor to provide the projects with which finance will work. So we have to work on both sides, and today we hope we initiate this dialogue intensely. Thank you.